Great. Well, thanks, and um, welcome to the party. My name is uh, Josef Lensch. I am a managing partner of the Innovation in Politics Institute. I'm also publisher and founder of Party Party, which, as it happens, is launching today with this panel. The platform is going online right now, and we have people not only in this room, but also a crowd of people watching on YouTube, the live stream. So welcome also to the people in their offices and at home watching this panel. Um, it's great that, that you made your time. We know, I think, all that, that political parties need to change. We, need, we know why they need to change, what they need to change, but what we know the least about is how they actually can change. And this is what we're going to look at today with a distinguished panel, which I'm going to introduce in a second. In the meantime, um, if you have your programs with you, there's a QR code um, next, to, next to our section in the program, and you can scan it, and this will bring you to a Mentimeter, because we ask two things of you. The first question is, how positive are you about the future of political parties? Question number one. And then there is an open section where you can tell us what specific questions you have for the panel. Marie here will, um, she's a program manager, my colleague Marie, she will also feed in questions from the Mentimeter. So if you want to ask somebody on the stage, and that the same goes for the people at home and in their offices uh, in the live stream, please tell us your questions. All right, let's get this party started. First of all, I want to Welcome, Benedicta Lasi, to my very right. She has been Secretary General of Socialist International since November 22. She's a trained corporate and commercial lawyer who was born in Ghana and is now based mostly in London, but really much around the world. 
Um, she's the co-founder of the African Leadership Society and the Africa Investment Consortium with degrees of University of Ghana and the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center. Welcome, Benedicta. <laughs> Next to her is sitting Birgitta Olson, who is the director for political parties of the National Democratic Institute. She was Minister for European Union Affairs in the Swedish government from 2010 to 2014. Um, and in her role at the NDI, among other things, she is helping political parties to learn from each other, for example, with initiatives like the Political Party Peer Network. She has degrees from Stockholm University, Yale, and Harvard Kennedy School. Welcome, Birgitta. <clears throat> Left of me is Louisa Pettersson, who is a project manager at the Centre Party, the Swedish Liberal Party. She's actually currently on maternity leave, but she made the time and she left, uh, her, you left the kid with your parents. Thanks for that. Thanks for making the time. <laughs> and Louisa works in, I think, one of the few teams in a political party that is dedicated to organizational development. And I'm looking forward to talking about that. She has degrees in archaeology, which I find very interesting, from Goethe University and philosophy from Stockholm University. Welcome, Louise. And welcome as well to Pepin van Dijk. Since May 2021, he's been the executive director of VVD, a Dutch liberal party. He has extensive international experience in startups, politics, politics and NGOs. And he's currently working to get one of Europe's most successful parties ready for the next transformation. He is an alumnus of Think School of Creative Leadership and the University of Amsterdam. Welcome, Pepin. So, first of all, a question to the podium. If you, you know, answer the same question as uh, the audience and the people at home, um, you know, if you're very optimistic about the future of political parties to, you know, very pessimistic, can, can, you, can you show me your hands? Where, where, would you, where would you put your hand there? <laughs> where would you put your hand? Yeah, quite, quite optimistic. All right, it, it will be interesting to see um, what the results are uh, on, in, in the audience. Yes, so we posed a question on, from zero to ten. How optimistic are you about the future of political parties? And as usual with political parties, there's a trend towards the middle. So um, the strongest, um, we have six as the strongest um, number mentioned. And then we have more uh, a trend towards the lower numbers, I must, say, I must say. And then we have one very optimistic person who gave us a 10. So it's I, I'd like to meet this person who is uh, the, the one uh, very optimistic person. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, I think it's a mixed bag, right? And, and, and I don't think it's a surprise that the people sitting on here are, are potentially more optimistic than, than some, some other people. Um, and, of course, we want to find out why. And I would like to start with the practitioners who are working with, with, with parties um, Louisa and, and Peppa, and Louisa, if I, if I perhaps may, may start with you, um, as I said, right, you, are, um, you have been working for the last years in the organization development of Centre Partite. Now, you know, for, first of all, perhaps you can tell us what this actually means, because not a lot of parties actually do work on organization development. I think it's an underrated discipline in politics. Can you give us some insights in your work and also, you know, some of the obstacles and, and successes that, that, that you've had? Uh, so, uh, basically my role is someone has an idea, uh, normally the national board, or there's been a proposal from the national gathering, um, and I take that idea uh, and supposed to make it happen. <laughs> I make a plan, uh, there's a goal, there's an idea, what you want, where you want to reach, what you want to change. Uh, so, I always start with making a plan, what, how are we going to make this happen? Um, and then ask, is this a good idea? Do you think this is a good plan? And not just asking the national board, do you like my idea? Uh, also asking our members, uh, our political leaders, uh, the organization's leaders, uh, is this a good idea? Can we make this happen by doing it this way? Uh, and listening to them. 
So basically, I'm a form of a link between, between the national board, um, the leaders, but also down on the entire organization. Uh, how do we make change happen together? Because we can have all the brilliant ideas we want, but if people are not on board and want to make this change happen uh, in their everyday life, if it doesn't work for them, then it's not going to happen. That, that sounds like a, like a quite structured innovation process in some ways. Can you give us some examples of, of successes and fails that, you, that you've had over the, over the last years? Yeah, the, the project it's kind of changed over the years, but the first time I got uh, one of the project was in 2019, so much better. It was basically, uh, they said, go out in Europe, uh, benchmark, find best practice, good ideas, uh, and the focus is organization at large, <laughs> and uh, find out good best practice that we can then apply uh, to us. So we started with a pre-study, talking, VVD was one of the parties we have been talking a lot to. Uh, you have good ideas. <laughs> uh, and then after the pre-study, we find, found different focus areas, but the main one we found was to be interesting was about in, engaging people. How do we create in, uh, engaged members? Uh, a lot of times I can meet uh, branches or regions where you say, we need more members. Uh, and they say, what? we are just 10 people that are active. Okay, but you are 90 people in your branch. What are the rest doing? How can we activate those you already have? Um, so we started focusing on how to create engaging members. Um, and in the end... This is still very much ongoing, uh, and in the end, one of the things we actually saw that we needed to change a bit more was our, the digital, how we worked with our systems. Uh, it's not just us people. We need to work smart using all the digital infrastructure in the correct way. So one of the examples uh, that we actually can use is how to use the onboarding uh, there is one point in time when we know people are on the same page, and that is when you actually sign in to become a member in our organization. Uh, so what, what happens then? What can we do to make a good onboarding for everyone? And then you move along into the organization in different ways. Uh, but what we saw then was we want to engage people, and we want to start with the onboarding, but we can't do it because we don't have the infrastructure we need. So in a few years, as I said, this is ongoing, but in a few years we are hopefully going to see that when we have the onboarding we want, that's when we know that the project actually is a success. Great. So, so I want to highlight a few things that you said, right? You, you, you said, first of all, you have a very structured approach to, to managing ideas in the organization. You apparently did a process where you went out and, and, and identified um, on the political market, so to say, parties that you may, may, be, may be able to learn from. You interviewed them. So again, you know, a very structured way of, of, of identifying potentials, things that, that you may, may make use of. Um, and, and then you identified also critical points along the journey of a new member. So that all sounds, sounds quite innovative to me in a very um, uh, traditional party. How old is the Centre Partite? I think it's 111. Around it's 111. There, yeah, somewhere around that. Uh, we're old. <laughs> very, very old. Thanks, thanks, Luis. Thanks for those insights. Now, VVD is not quite as old, but, but also quite, quite traditional, uh, isn't it? Well, we just celebrated our 75th birthday uh, a couple of months ago. So that's, that's quite old, I would say. And, and also, of course, it's a very, very successful party. Uh, it has been in government since 2000. 12, is that correct? Uh, we've been power now for 13 years, I think, yeah, 13 years. Now, now of course, um, for a party that's in government, um, it, it's especially hard in some ways to, to innovate the party, right? Because all the focus is on, on the government, is on power, is on keeping and retaining power. So how do you actually 
manage still to innovate and transform the party? Can you give us a little bit of insights there? Well, I was hoping to, to, to keep the painful bit for a bit later, Joseph. Okay, let's dive right in, into it. Um, no, being in power does make it more difficult, I think, because uh, power has the, the uh, well, it does something to people. You want to stay in power, of course, so yeah, you're inclined to look for things that consolidate your power, your money, your membership base, etc. While uh, we also think that you need to be able to innovate if you want to be in power in 10 years from now, or at least be a relevant player in, 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 in politics. So I took up the challenge to, to see if I, coming from the outside, because I'm not a party hack, uh, but uh, to try to bring some of the thinking in, inside the party and uh, basically trying to build a platform from within that has the capacity of you know, getting new members, a new generation of uh, new ways of communicating, um, new ways of recruiting talent. And I think those are three important pillars. And like with Centre Partit, uh, it all started, it's quite amazing that it's the same everywhere, with getting your basic digital infrastructure right. Um, it was, I was pretty amazed coming from the outside that it's still pretty, let's say, 1.0. Um, so that's a big project we're running now, trying to um, step up the game on the, on the digital side, which will enable us to better communicate and hopefully better engage with new groups, new, uh, new generations, basically. Can you give us a little bit of, 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 a, of a flavor of how it was you entering you know, the political organization? You said you're not a party hack, you come from, from startups, you come from, from uh, the social innovation, so you have a different background. And, you know, and, and, and some would say, you know, in a powerful and political position like a chief executive, it's very hard for someone to actually get a foothold and, and build up the alliances that you need in a political organization. So how was that, how was that for you? Challenging. Uh, we're among friends, so I can tell the truth. And now it's, it's challenging because uh, uh, people do want to see change, but every time that real change happens or there's a proposal coming in, it's also a bit frightening or it doesn't square with the daily reality. Because let's be honest, uh, when you're in politics, you have to deal with the political arena. You need to fight your fights over there. And you don't want to bother with the, with the long-term stuff, so to say. Um, so yeah, then it's important to have the right coalition in place, to have the right people, which is challenging as well, because coming from a uh, you know, different background, I try to get those people in, so people are interested in politics, are interested in societal change, etc., but find it hard to either commit to a party or to, to work in politics, because it's, it's a different, different situation, it's a different environment. Uh, so good marketeers, good digital people, uh, all that kind of people. So, um, yeah, maybe we should give them more maternity leave. I don't know. Maybe that helps. Thanks a lot. So, Socialist International Benedicta is, of course, uh, a global organization that features many um, uh, established parties, also some with a, with a long, long history. Uh, and, of course, we talked beforehand, right? I mean, there are many, many different circumstances and, and, and peculiar uh, systems, but still perhaps there's something, you know, parties can learn from each other. So if, if, you, if you look at, you know, from your global perspective, what's, what's going on when it comes to innovating in, in your uh, field, socialist, social democratic parties? Can you give us a little bit of insights, what's going on there, and perhaps also who perhaps interesting parties are to watch? So I think um, when it comes to political parties, I think in the feedback that was given about how optimistic uh, people were about political parties, being a party hawk who has um, worked and done politics um, at the same time and have been a political junkie, as some people would call it, over the years, I think that the perspectives of political activists or members of political parties are quite different from what sometimes the role of political parties are. And it's the two sides of the coin, whereas you have members of the party looking at the party to say, we want you to be a bit more responsive to the needs of the people. You also have a governance system or a system of democracy that actually requires political parties to be the vehicle through which um, we actually undertake politics. And so you cannot do away with politics even if we are not so happy in terms of where political parties currently sit. Now, you've seen a lot of protest movements um, in recent times who have been very populist in their rhetoric. 
Most of them are transitioning into political parties. But what we've seen is that most of them are not structured. So yes, they are anti-establishment, and they usually would have a single issue agenda. So they come into the political system campaigning for specific issues. But what they sort of do not foresee is that as political parties, you don't go into government or you don't seek to be in government to just solve one problem. And so there's the need for us to begin to educate citizens as political parties and as um, activists in the political systems across the world to say, yes, our political parties might not be where we want them to be, but those are the fundamental pillars we need to foster development and democracy within our countries. That's the first point. Secondly, if you take various political parties around the world, in terms of institutional development, as um, my co-panelists have mentioned, it is not something we think of on a daily basis. So it is an electoral cycle. You elect a party leader. The party leader comes in, works with the party system, uh, mobilizes support towards an election. After the elections, based on results, you are either in government as a majority or in Europe, you are either in a coalition and you're trying to work with your coalition partners to define the platform or the policies that you want to advance in, in, whilst in government. Now, all those processes are required for us to not have an anarchy within the various countries. And so, having recognized that these are important steps, we need to then take a back seat to say, as Socialist International, which um, I don't know if all of us know about Socialist International here, but Socialist International is the largest political organization international in the world with political parties from over 132 countries, progressive political parties, socialists, social democrats, and uh, labor parties. And most of our parties are established parties. But what we are also recognizing is that there's the need for us to have some introspection to answer the questions that we have not offered answers to in the past, for which reason we are seeing a number of parties using the populist narrative to try and then come in to say, yes, we are anti-establishment and the political parties as they exist are not serving your needs and we have a solution. Just last week, and I would um, end with this example, in Spain, there's a regional election going on. We had parties launch their manifestos. I read in the news that the third largest party, which actually came out of a protest movement, which is Vox, had a manifesto that was similar for all the municipalities. So because maybe the focus has been on a particular issue, there hasn't been a lot of thinking through the ways in which you tailor policies to address the needs of specific municipalities. And so without that institutional base of a political party having that capacity to look within, to say, these are the policies, these are our members, this is how we actually come up with a manifesto within specific districts that feed into a national agenda, you would be faced with that situation where you have protest movements transforming into political parties, but really they do not have what it takes or um, the institutional systems to put in place policies that actually address the needs of the people. And when you want to go into politics or you want to serve the people, what you are seeking to do is to offer solutions to problems. It is not just to talk about the problems, it's to offer solutions. So if we are finding out now that most of the protest movements that have transformed into political parties are coming on board with the mindset of, yes, we have one single issue, and that's all we want to um, advocate for. It creates further polarization, and 
it makes people feel that, you know what, there's no solution. But I think what is important is for us to turn the light inward to ask ourselves, how do we better transform the parties as we have them now? And that's why I'm very optimistic about the future of political parties. Thank you. Quick, qu quick question and perhaps a short answer. I know in your position you cannot have favorite parties. But if you, you know, if you think about when you talk about introspection and, and you know, looking at how we transform, are there any, you know, can you name one or two examples of parties where you think there is some, something good going on? If you can perhaps kind of quickly name some names, if that's possible. You're going to put me in trouble. <laughs> but I think um, our party in Spain, I think maybe because there has been an electoral, there's an ongoing electoral cycle and um, our president is uh, also the prime minister of Spain and me following the work they are doing at the local levels, I, I think I'm very optimistic. We also see in Labour Party in the UK that has um, actually been quietly working on, on the party and trying to rebuild um, from the previous um, issues that they, they faced with engagement with people. So I think there's a lot more parties, but I think this two, I would say, are doing great. Spain and, and UK, thanks very much. And Portugal. And Portugal. Yes. Portugal, of yes. course, also Portugal, yeah. very successful uh, socialist party. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. Birgitta, in, in, your, in your current role now as um, a, a director of political parties at NDI, you, you also work with, with different political parties, but you also work across um, political families and political spectrums um, across the globe and also transatlantically. So what, what's your take on, on, on innovation? What do you see? What, what are the interesting developments that, 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 that you sense? And also, you know, thinking about networks like the political uh, party peer network, how important is this exchange cross-family, cross-country? What, what value does that provide, perhaps, to the innovation of political parties? Well, of course, in innovation is extremely important, uh, and, and innovation for me, it's about, um, I mean, involving people in decision making. That's kind of the core thing. But I think sometimes we maybe are focusing too much of the kind of technical aspects of innovation, and I think maybe we should ask political parties more, what is your soul? And uh, we had a very prominent p politician from, from the VVD party, Hans Hambalen, that passed away a few years ago, and he said, if people do not recognize your party, they will not vote for your party. And I think that was very much to the point. And I think quite a lot of people, both um, established democracies that's been around for more than 100 years ago or, or, or new, new movement-based parties, tend to struggle a lot to identify who they are. And that's why I think so many of them are tempted to kind of drink and mix this, this very toxic political cocktail of, of polarization and populism and disinformation and so on. So I think back to basic is very important. But talking about parties, I mean, we have a lot of uh, talking about the innovation and that kind of side. I mean, we have a lot of, I mean, I would say very kind of savvy parties around the world. I mean, we have in, in for example, in, in Australia, we have the Flux Party that some of you might know of uh, that tried to create a more... Um, I would say kind of modern um, approach, uh, um, they call it like liquid democracy <laughs> uh, when it comes to, to representing people. We also have different initiatives in Brazil and quite a few other countries. But sometimes I think we're, we're kind of building this conflict between the, the old school parties that has been around for, for hundreds of years and then the new movement based parties. And I think sometimes we tend to have this tendency to maybe regard the new movement-based parts as very, this very romantic shimmer, that they're so modern, they're so inclusive, and very often you find a case that they tend to have a very strong leader, and it tends to be a man very often, and, and the, the democratic structure could be actually worse compared to parties that has been around for, for example, Centre Partite and more 100 years. So I think that's also important to focus on that democracy. Are these parties democratic? Are they inclusive? Are they listening to the voters? What kind of core values do they have? Kind of go back to basic a bit. And to highlight another part from the kind of old school thing that I think is kind of innovative. I mean, um, I work for the NDI now, National Democratic Institutes. We work with Democratic Party. We work with the Socialist International, Liberal International, um, Progressive Alliance, and, and the Centrist Democratic International, and quite a few others. But it's Democratic parties that we work with. Uh, but I have my liberal background, so I'm going to favorize a liberal part from the old school world. And that's the Lib Dems in the UK. 
when I left, I, I, I joined politics when I was 19 years old and had was 16 years in, in the Swedish parliament, five years as a minister, and I left politics when I was 44, so I was still younger than, than maybe the youngest parliamentarian in many countries around the world when I left. But then I moved to, moved to the UK, so I lived one year in, in, in Oxford, and, and I'm still part of this little face group, group for the local Lib Dem politicians. And, they're kind of old school. They do the canvassing. They're out like every weekend, every evening. They go out in there. They know their hoods. They know their neighborhoods. They know everything about what the voters are thinking. They start to kind of um, gog the interest, but also start interesting conversations. Uh, that sometimes they do not have the political answer, but they're raising something interesting. Uh, hey, we have this public school in this area. But the housing prices are so, ba are so high in this area, so not even the principal that she's been working for 40 or 50 years could afford to live in this area. Is that a good society? And they, then they start a conversation around that, that they're involving people in. So I think that's also good to kind of see these, these two different um, uh, parts of the, of the coin. Thank you. I want to raise one more question before I want to bring in uh, the questions from the audience uh, here and, and in front of the monitors. The question is about time. Time, of course, is very peculiarly structured in politics. It's mostly defined by election cycles, and those may be four years, five years, in some cases, and you know, nowadays in many countries, more like one or two years. Um, I mean, if you look at Greece, for example, and other countries right at the moment, there may be even more than one election in one year. But in any way, elections define time. Now, when it comes to innovating parties, that, of course, is a, is a, a different time. So... How, how long does it take to transform a political party from your perspective? What's, what's, a, what's a time frame that you would say, you know, if it's not just one, I don't know, you know, introducing a new app, you know, so to say, but really kind of a wholesale transformation that, 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 that modernizes a political party, how long does that take? What, what would you say is, is, is a realistic expectation for that? Who wants to... Yeah, uh, well, of course, we, we don't know, um, but maybe, maybe to answer your, your question in a quite di a bit different way, I think what we see, and I think Brigitte was mentioning it, we see quite some initiatives popping up, um, democratic, political, and they tend to fade away. Uh, they're great, they have the energy, they have the, the, the right amount of, 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 of the right people, I would say, but then they fade away. So, so I think what would, would be really nice is to find a way to have a, a kind of a hybrid party, where you have the social fabric of the traditional parties, like here uh, at, on the stage, uh, combined with the agility and, the, and the, the, the new energy and the new vibes of startup parties. And for now, it's those, I would say those rooms are pretty divided, and that's a shame. I think we should learn from each other. Uh, and then it can get, that's where I'm, where I'm coming to your question. I think then it can go quicker. But as long as we keep those barriers up, it's going to take a lot of time, I think, to, to innovate from within. At least that's what I'm witnessing, and I think that's it. And then you're talking about years and years interrupted by all those elections. We have an election, one election a year now, uh, from regional, European, national, etc. And that's only when the, when the cabinet doesn't <laughs> stays in power, of course. So, yeah, there's a, there's a challenge. I think we could speed it up. We need to speed it up. But um, if we don't, it's, 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 we're talking about a decade, yeah, probably. We're talking about a decade. Well, one probably, yeah. Or something big happens. I mean, if you look at history, if there's a big shock, electoral or different, then parties can switch straight away. I guess, I guess sometimes, I mean, uh, for better or for worse, uh, of course, scandals can be accelerators, right? I mean, if there's a whatever corruption scandal or something else, then this may kind of be an, uh, an event that, that accelerates the, inf the transformation. But I mean, 10 years, it's a, it's, it's a long time, right? I mean, almost no party chairwoman or chairman is, is, is in, in office 10 years, right? And I think that's, that's a big problem because how do you protect the process throughout this time? How do you manage to not interrupt, you know, but get interrupted and then start afresh? Um, but, but, but also looking at the other ones, kind of what, you know, Pepin says a decade. What, what would you say? How, how long? What, what, what is realistic? Is that, is that also your view, 10 years? Or what, what do you think? I think it would depend on where particular political party is now, because I think some political parties have actually recognized the need for some innovation, some reforms, and have started the process. I wouldn't put a specific timeline on it, because I think as um, 
the communities evolve, we have to keep evolving. What I would say, however, is that there's a need for us to recognize the need for um, a separate team that is not necessarily involved in the electoral cycles or the electoral process to have an, an inward looking but with an outward outlook um, to look at what the parties can do to, to innovate and to reform. We cannot put specific timelines on it, but I think parties must recognize the need for this reform, ask how well are we doing within our communities. And as you're well aware, parties in Europe are very much different in their operations and in their systems as compared to other parties in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America. In Africa, you would hardly find a country where there is political party financing. Some of these issues which are peculiar to specific countries has implications on how politics is organized and how the political parties function. So I think most of the conversations that need to be had on reforms has to be had within the country contest um, and also having those broader conversations with political parties and the various stakeholders in in those countries to say, yes, we need our political parties to be a bit more responsive. How can the country or the government work with various political parties to achieve the same? And I think it's recognizing the need for us to start from somewhere that's important. I wouldn't put a timeline on it. Thanks a lot. At, at, at this point, I would like to bring in the audience. Um, first of all, Marie, um, thanks for raising the hand. But um, let me look at Marie yes. first. Um, are there kind of a couple of... Um, I see you, I see you. Um, are there a, a, a couple of questions from, from uh, the Mentimeter yes. that we may bring in? Two or three, perhaps? Yes. So there are a lot of questions coming in. So thank you. And maybe also in the room, if you use Mentimeter for your questions, we can get them to the panel. Um, a lot of questions focus on membership and how to get membership numbers up again and at the same time get parties to be a bit more representative, diverse in their members in terms of gender, age, socioeconomic background. So from your side, how can parties be better at that? And then another question, um, I'm just going to read it out loud. What is your number one suggestion to bring politicians from different parties to truly work together on the solutions our countries need instead of fighting on TV? Thank you very much. So perhaps the, the, the membership and diversity question I would... I would um, first of all address to you but of course feel free to comment and the kind of how to get actually parties work together i would i would i would i would look at you for the, for that so of course the, the the mass membership parties are 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 passed right to to a large degree so we're now talking about smaller memberships now there's still this sense of that parties need memberships not just for the sake of it but to have some kind of uh, legitimacy uh, democratically. So, you know, how do you work to get to get membership numbers at least not further down in many in many cases, but but you know, stable or even back up. And the second thing is how how can we make parties more inclusive? What what how how can we get them more diverse? Um, uh, Luis, do you wanna you wanna kick us off? Sure. Um, well, in a lot of ways, uh, doesn't really matter when we all want to engage people. In the end, it's about you and me. Uh, I need to actually go out and ask people. We can do all the campaigns we want, of course. They are wonderful and they work. But in the end, I need to go and ask you, do you want to become a member? Um, and this is very scary. <laughs> and not everyone likes it. Not everyone is good at it. Um, but we can also train in this. We can become more comfortable in actually asking the questions. So if we need more members, we need to dare to go out and ask people to actually become a member. Uh, and after that, we need to ask them, how do you wish to be a part of our organization? What do you want to do within? Does technology play a role in that, or is it really kind of about the, the, the in-person, face-to-face in interaction? Can, can, can that be substituted or complemented in some ways by you know, membership apps or, or digitally... Um, AI-driven processes, you know, all the rage. Is there something that, that you're experimenting with at the moment? Yeah, we started, um, we built an app because uh, when we, one question I started asking 
uh, during this uh, long process was are you engaging or are you informing? Uh, because we are very good, all of us are extremely good at informing people about what we are doing. Uh, take for instance, if you are posting something in social media, I had an ice cream. Okay, good for you. Instead you say, I went out and bought vanilla ice cream. What is your flavor? What do you like for ice cream? Instead of actually just informing people of what we are doing, we need to start asking questions and engaging and start asking why we are doing things. Uh, and this also includes in how we talk to our members and voters and those we want to become members. Uh, so if we want our members to start being more engaged, so at one point we built an app and launched it a little over a year ago. This was for all the members because we said instead of just sending out information to our members and hoping that they will get engaged, we need to take control of the engagement. So we built an app uh, based on the preferences and the needs of the members um, and then we, develop, we have one product that needs to be keep, keep on developing. It's not a point in time. We need to keep developing it because needs change. Uh, but we, where we actually can start engaging with our members in different ways, asking questions, doing polls, uh, telling them, use them yourselves in, in your branches or in your region. You can use the tools yourself to just keep engaging people. Thanks a lot. Pepper, and I think I'm not mistaken if, if I'm saying that VVD is probably more on the male-heavy side um, in, in terms of membership, um, like many political uh, parties, center, center, right. How do you make such a party more diverse? What, what do you do? What, what are your initiatives to, to, to try to, to change that? It's, it's, a, it's a hard one because our membership base is male, uh, 50 plus and white for a, to a great extent. So uh, that's where we're coming from. Um, we see that we, that needs to change. I think the first step, I mean, I agree with everything Louisa has said, uh, but I think we should also uh, uh, add something to that, that we're talking about members. And membership is for most people, or for let's say the majority of people, a, a big step. So we, 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 should be a, we, should be, we should create different kinds of adherence or ambassadorships or participation. Uh, manners than we than only the membership that that's what typically in our case in the Netherlands it's either you're a member or you're not and uh, so I, we, we, we're experimenting now with different kinds of um, of, uh, of connection of linking with the party either in terms of uh, you can participate on a platform or you can just join for one cup of coffee or you see and then use LinkedIn for that did I understand it correctly or LinkedIn no sorry what, what did you said you, you to, to link people to, to, people to 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 yes. say the broader party, in, you know, either people or, or digitally. Um, and from there you start the conversation and maybe they will turn into a paying member later on. But that's, that's the switch we have to make and that's, uh, that's our one. I mean, we have over 2 million voters year over year, but we only have 25,000 members. Um, so there has a big gap. There's at least some of, those, some of those people could be converted into a more active base, I would say. And hopefully less male, less white, less, uh, less old. Thank you. Getting parties to work together is a challenge, I think, for, for both of you from different perspectives. How, you know, how, how, do you, how do you get parties to work together, not just for the sake of it, but to address challenges? I mean, we don't have to count you know, climate change and, and, and all the other big challenges that we're facing. How do you do that? What, 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 what would you be your best advice or what would be the best experiences on that? Well, I would say uh, when I started off at NDI, one of the things that was very frustrating for me was that the, the party internationals were very much stuck in their silos, that they didn't interact very much. And it's not like that they need to have the same opinions about different things or the same because they come from different ideologies. But if you want to stop the democratic backsliding, you need to unite at least around the basic things about democracy. And I think that's like a good start. So that's why we initiated a, a program a few years ago called the the cross-party collaboration network, where we work with the party internationals, and now we're going to have a stronger focus on the political youth wing organizations, because I think that they've been quite neglected in the, in the big debate about party development uh, and so on. So I think that's very important. I mean, if you want to, 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 to combat climate change, if you want to, to solve future and coming pandemics or defend democracy, you need to unite around these things. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's not possible. And I can see among, when we do surveys, when we meet political parties, we can see, especially among 
I would say, younger politician. It's a stronger appetite for this. But also, I would say, it's a bit of a stronger appetite among parties that are liberal, center, and to the left than on the conservative side. So that's also interesting when we're interacting and, and so on. And just about just connecting to one of the previous questions about how, how, how quick it could be to transform a party. Sometimes it could be super quick. Um, and servants of the people in Ukraine is a very, I think, interesting example. I was leading the election observation back in March 2019 for, for, for the NDI and IRI. And the politicians that we met, I mean, it was a movement-based party, came out of a TV show, et cetera, et cetera, and now they're defending the free world. And I think also what is so strong at the moment when we see, even though we have a war going on in Ukraine at the moment, the political parties, they still continue to work. They launched new ideas, new proposals. I had politicians reaching out to me some time ago about same-sex marriage issues, and we would think that would, might not be the top priority at the moment because it's, it's, uh, it's been a very conservative country for many years, but some people wanted to continue to work on that. So I think that's very hopeful to see that parties can reform very quickly sometimes. Benedict, a short response. What, what, what would you say? How do you get parties work together effectively to address, you know, real challenges? We need to keep parties accountable. I think um, we must push them to stay on the issues because sometimes when it's when they neglect the issues and focus on personalities, then they can go to the extremes of attacking each other. But to the extent that citizens are keeping political parties accountable and also um, in terms of who they decide to vote for is based on the conduct of, let's say, a political party or a political party's leader, that serves as a message, a strong message, because political parties understand one language, what their electoral fortunes are, and they would learn those lessons in a much um, quicker way. So, yes, we have to take steps. And I think um, Begita mentioned we had a, a peer network uh, meeting in Washington a couple of weeks back where we're looking at polarization and how, as international platforms for political parties, we can urge our members to begin to look at how we work together. Some fundamental issues we must have the basic understanding on that these are the issues that we at least agree on in federal democracy. There are some issues we would never agree on, and that is fine, but we must agree to disagree, and that's the only way to assure that the interest of the citizens is what's coming first. Thank you. I think it's, it's, it's often right, it's about, it's about creating forums to allow for serendipity. Um, and in, in the end, you know, at, for example, at this Washington event we met. Exactly. And this is why, this is why we're sitting here together on a exactly. panel, right? So it's, and I think this is also what we're doing here today, um, during the day and in the evening, cr trying to create serendipity for, for encounters that allow then for, for innovative ideas and innovative aspects. Uh, Madam, as you courageously raised your hand before, is it a short question or? Very quickly, because we are running out of time, but if you want to... Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. So, so final question. You know, one, of course, big innovation at the moment are deliberative formats. Now, some, you know, some, of course, challenge political parties altogether and say, you know, we should do away with all of them. Uh, we should just have citizen assemblies in the future. So, so can you very, very quickly, in just one or two sentences, give me your ideas on what the future relationship should be, kind of, and how open are you to share power? What kind of really just very, very quickly and brief, please. Open. That's the shortest answer. Uh, in, 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 in Holland, we have a, we have such a thing on, on climate coming uh, with government support, so it does exist. I think it should play a bigger role. Uh, to be honest, this is a discussion we are having, and uh, there's uh, pros and cons um, within the party. But I think that's one of the things where innovation comes in and where you need to, uh, to have the, the guts to step up. So I, do, I really believe in that. I'm trying to get that, uh, that uh, happening. But maybe just a quick thing, because I think you forgot one question after we discussed it, how much time does it take for a traditional party to change? We said 10 years or maybe a couple of years. The follow-up question could have been, is that a good thing? Is that, is that doable? And I think we don't have the time. So we're running out of time. So it's, it needs to happen faster. Um, um, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not advocating waiting for 10 years. Thanks. I think the best way to learn is to listen. Uh, and we need to listen to people. 
uh, politicians get elected by the people. Uh, and instead of informing that we've made a decision, we should include people during the decision making. As I said, there is an idea. Uh, include people, um, the voters, the people in the society before you make the decision. So, yeah, I think it's interesting. Thank you. Benedicta, how open are you from your perspective? Quite open. I, I think that civil society, for instance, uh, is playing a big role in the global south. And we are seeing that most of the parties that have been successful um, are the ones that are actually actively engaged in civil society. Um, and this also applies to Europe and other parts of the world where we are realizing there's this new age of convergence of ideas. So you would really be shooting yourself in the foot if you do not um, work with the broader uh, platforms of engagement. Thank you. Bigger, do you have the last word? Yes, yeah, so, well, everyone, we have, we have a one mouth and, and two ears. So, I mean, that's kind of very basic. So listening is better. Thanks a lot. Um, and also looking forward to your keynote tonight at the gala, where we hope to see all of you. In the meantime, thanks for joining the party. Please do subscribe. Um, you can have all the information in the program and on here. Um, if, if party Party is uh, for now free, and it's also open to all political families, all political parties across countries. Please do join. Please let us know what you think. Thanks very much for being part. Thanks, for, thanks everyone on the panel, for a great discussion. Have a good rest of the day. <laughs>